Welcome to Fast Forward. Our guest this episode is Alan Smale, whose first novel from Del Rey, Clash of Eagles, is in bookstores now. Alan, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. It's, uh, it's, it, it's interesting to have someone who's written their first novel. You've been a writer for, for, for a very long time. You've been doing short fiction for years. When did you actually start writing? I started writing very young. Uh, I was probably was interested in writing before I was interested in astronomy, which is my day job. Uh, I, I learned to read pretty young, and because of that, I, I burned through the books in my rather school primary, rather small primary school library quite quickly. And so I started making up my own stories, like a lot of children do, I guess. And uh, so my first story, I think, was called The Mountain Children, and it was about the three, three kids who are living in the jungle, kind of like Tarzan. So I've been <coughs> writing for a great deal of time. Uh, it, about 20 years ago, I decided to get serious about it, and that was when I started really writing for publication, and I've been publishing short fiction ever since then. Yeah, your, first, your first published work was in 1993, I believe? Yes, that's right, yeah. And it's interesting, you have a, a, a very developed, uh, let, let's talk about your work work for a second, mm -hmm. because I want to place it in perspective. You're the director of High Energy Astrophysics Science Archive Research Center at NASA. That's right, the HESOC, as we call it. The HESOC. What is the HESOC? The HESOC is actually a data archive. It's one of the three main NASA data archives. And what the HESOC archives is high energy data, so data from X ray astronomy, gamma ray astronomy. Uh, so it's very high energy data and so from uh, X ray binaries and uh, AGN and that. Kind and, of thing. And, and that data is what creates some of the most spectacular. Uh, reconstructed photographs of shots of the universe that come out down from Hubble and some of the other other mm -hmm. uh, satellites. Am I correct? Yes, that's right. The optical data is stored at MAST, which is another archive, and another one of the three archives, and that's up at the Space Telescope Science Institute. So that's where the optical data go, and we're the equivalent facility for the high energy data. So you have this extensive scientific background. Mm -hmm. You you like to write fiction, and yet the focus of your first novel and of much of your short fiction is not hard science. No. It's more alternate history, or, or in some instances, there are fantasy elements. Mm -hmm. Why is that area something you wanted to write about versus using the knowledge that you have of the physical universe uh, not being, you know, not, not the basis for, for the creation of your fiction? Mm -hmm. One of the things about writing hard science fiction, I have written some and had, had it published, but when I'm writing hard science fiction, it's somehow a little bit like the day job. So it's like I, I spend all my time being a research astronomer and doing technical things at work. And then I'm thinking in a very similar mindset when I come home and when I'm writing. Uh, I've always been interested in history, and about 10 or 15 years ago, I suppose, I started getting more interested in writing history. I think pretty much since then, most of what I've written has been uh, alternate history or t twisted or secret histories, historical fantasy, that kind of thing. It's just, just the genre that I really enjoyed writing in, and it was completely different from what I was doing in the office, so it makes a mental break, and I enjoyed it a lot. Well, Clash of Eagles, mm -hmm. which is based on a rather well-received novella that was written a number of years earlier, mm -hmm. which I believe also received the uh, uh, Sidewise Award? Yes, the Sidewise kind of? Award for Alternate History is the preeminent award for, for that kind of and, writing. And it, it, there's an, it's an interesting concept. It's basically a Rome that did not fall to the barbarians, mm -hmm. being the first to seriously land on and explore the North American continent. Yes. What changed in your mind in history, in the history of Rome, to allow this scenario to be placed in a book? Yes, at the beginning of the book, it's 1218 AD, and so you can see that the Roman Empire has survived a long time after, its, uh, after the fall of the Western Roman Empire in about the 5th century AD. Uh, what changed, uh, my branching off point is 211 AD. It's actually at the end of the reign of the Emperor Septimius Severus, and he had two sons, and he uh, did one of the one popular Roman things, which was to try and give the empire to both of the sons so that they would rule equally. And one of them was Caracalla, and the other one was Geta. And of course, in our history, what happened was that Caracalla killed his brother almost immediately. Uh, he was dead before the end of the year, and Caracalla went on to, to rule the empire for many years, and he was a rather cruel and sadistic emperor. And what happens in my world is that uh, Gator actually survives the assassination attempt, and the empire is plunged into civil war at that point between these, between these two, because Gator has a, a strong, solid following in Britain and in other parts of the empire. So there's this huge civil war between them that Gator ends up winning, and he's a much more moderate man. He's a 
much more learned man, and he becomes a much better emperor after he's defeated his brother. And so effectively what happens is the whole crisis of the Third Empire is staved off, and that's when the, the decline and fall of the Roman Empire really started, was the, the, the rot really set in in the third century. And that's what does not happen in my universe, and the empire stays strong. And it, it, it's interesting. I'm, I'm not uh, breaking any rules or, or springing any surprises because I'm talking mostly about the stuff that's, that, that's used as promotional material in terms mm -hmm. of plot structure. Yes. But it's still not, there are still strains and stresses within the Roman Empire because now there's, uh, there's, there's that pressure from the east mm -hmm. coming in. The yes. Hun are now active and moving in their direction. Uh, and in any large bureaucracy, of course, there is going to be the uh, inertia that has to be fought mm -hmm. somehow. Usually in Rome, it was by expansion. And I guess mm -hmm. this particular expedition is part of that expansionary policy to broaden and basically have some place for the adventurous and the disruptive to go to and to put them to use. Yes, the Roman Empire really thrived on plunder. They would go and invade other countries and steal everything they could, essentially. Uh, they were, rather than having a strong production system of their own, they went and took what they wanted. And this is what's been happening over the last thousand years in, in my book. That, that's kind of consider, continued beyond the uh, beyond the, the range of where the Roman Empire was in our world. And so what's happened now is that they have moved east, they have moved into the Middle East, they've moved into what's now India and Pakistan. And as they've been moving uh, eastwards, they are now meeting Genghis Khan and the Mongols who are coming in the opposite direction. And so the, the main, it's off screen in the, in the first of the books, but uh, the main struggle that, that Rome is having at that point is fighting against the, uh, the, the Mongol invaders uh, on, the, on the steppe. And in Clash of Eagles, our focus is actually in the other direction because what uh, Rome is trying to do is it's trying to, it's trying to plunder more money. It's trying to get more money for the cause because it's a very expensive war to fight. And so a legion has been sent into the West, into this new continent of Nova Hesperia that's been discovered, which is our North America. And my lead character is the, is the legate, the, the general in charge of the legion that is now spearheading westward, looking for gold, looking for whatever they can find in the North American continent. And the first, the first portion of the book is really a, a, a description of the day-to-day -day activities mm -hmm. of a legion on the march, yes. the, the, the routine that it was a part of the Roman way mm -hmm. of proceeding into foreign territory. Yes. And, and I find that fascinating from a historical perspective, and it also drives the novel because several things are set in motion mm -hmm. that will come to fruition later in the book. But the question I have is, we, we see them come into contact with the natives. We see them come in contact with the coastal natives who were rather poor and not terribly warlike. Then they move forward into the east, into the Appalachian area, and they come in contact with uh, tribes of the five nations, the Iroquois. Iroquois, is, yes. And, and move through them, actually, and then come onto the plains, and then they meet uh, the nation of the mound builders, mm -hmm. the Cahoka. And that was fascinating to me because, quite honestly, I have never seen anything written about that civilization, which was quite impressive mm -hmm. and extensive. Yes, and that really amazed me because when I had the idea for the book and when I was researching it, I was thinking somebody must have written about the Mississippian culture and the Cahokia and the great city of Cahokia, which was the center of the Mississippian culture. Uh, somebody must have done this before. I couldn't have been lucky enough to stumble upon something that's so awesome and not have had several other people working in that genre. And there are there are a couple of historical novels set in that uh, in that milieu, but nobody's ever used it for science fiction or alternate history. And so uh, the field was clear. It was it was great to find that I could do that. And the Mississippi and culture is fascinating. And the great city of Cahokia, which is where St. Louis is now, now on, the, on the Mississippi, uh, that was a great city of 20,000 people. And there were mounds. And like you said, there were a mound building culture. They had platform mounds and ridge mounds and conical mounds. And there was a city of 20,000 people. Uh, and at that time, that city was larger than, than London would have been in the 12th, 13th centuries AD. And in fact, no city in North America was larger than that until around about the 1800s. So it was this rather colossal city for the times, the biggest city in North America. And uh, it was a great setting for the story. And it, it was really, uh, uh, I really enjoyed like, pitting the Roman legion up against this completely different culture, the Mississippian culture. And while I don't want to break the suspense of the first five or six chapters, it's mm -hmm. fairly plain in the, in the promotional material for the book mm -hmm. that Rome does not fare well in this initial conflict. Rome thinks it's going to have a blast. It thinks it's going to go straight through. Uh, what they see is a fairly uninhabited wilderness. They know there are a lot of people around on the coasts. 
Uh, they've met some people from the various tribes. They've had a little bit of trouble, but they think they're going to have a straight shot through. Uh, they've heard from their Norse scouts that there is a big city up ahead, so that they know there's a city that they're, they're heading towards. Uh, so they're, they're all keen to, to, to go and see what they can find there. They obviously don't think they're going to have anywhere near as much trouble as they do have, either with the Iroquois or with the Mississippian culture that, that follows. So yes, that's something of a shock to them that they, when they find out they've bitten off far more than they can chew. Uh, now, our central character is Gaius Marcellinus, mm -hmm. who is a praetor. He actually leads this particular legion, comes from yes. a family of military men, mm -hmm. quite successful and prominent military men. Yes. Uh, and he is, in the end, the only survivor of his legion after the final, final battle with the Cahokia nation. Yes. Why you, you, you chose a Roman to filter everything else through? Mm -hmm. All the the is was it did you was it a way to explain the culture at, in layers so that you could you get get people used to what it was mm -hmm. because he is he has difficulty understanding it he has difficulty with the language to start with. Yeah, he's the ultimate outsider in many ways, because uh, not only does he not know anything about that culture, but he's lived in a very different society all his life. He's lived in a very uh, imperialist society. He's lived within the army. Uh, Marcellinus knows about the army. He's been fighting in campaigns across Europe and way over into Asia. Uh, but he doesn't know much about other things. His own family life has been a bit of a disaster, for example. So he doesn't really know much about family and about community. And so the Native American culture is very different from the culture that he understands. Um, I found it was interesting to, to filter the experience through him. It's always uh, interesting to have an outsider going into a culture like that and experiencing it. And so the novel is very much in the close point of view of Marcellinus, so we see it through his eyes and see, see what he's seeing when he's coming to terms with this. Yes, he has communications difficulties when he first arrives, and I try and do that in a realistic kind of way. Uh, this is not a book where, where the hero is suddenly going to learn the language in three weeks and be conversing uh, knowledgeably with people at the end of that time. He actually has a rather difficult time being understood and getting ideas across, and they have difficulty understanding him, because from their point of view, he's a completely different animal than anything they're used to. Uh, so he, uh, so they, have, they, they make assumptions about him, and me, he makes assumptions about them. And you're seeing it through Marcellinus's eyes, and in some cases, uh, it may well be that the astute reader will be reading, will be picking up on nuances that Marcellinus himself isn't picking up on because he's seeing things through a lens that, that we don't have. Now, you, the Romans have a very hierarchical mm -hmm. society, and you describe a Mississippian culture that is much more driven by a gradual accumulation of consensus mm -hmm. yes. between the various clans within the the structure of the nation itself. Yes. How did you go about building it? What, how did, what kind of research were you able to do that allowed you to put this, this particular societal construct together? Mm. Uh, I did a huge amount of research on Cahokia. In fact, the reason why I wrote the book in the first place was that I've, first of all, I read Charles Mann's uh, 1491, which is about Native America before Columbus arrived. And uh, then after that, there was a section on Cahokia, and I got really interested. And then I started reading other popular and academic books about Cahokia. And so I was trying to make the background as accurate as possible. And there are some things we know a great deal about. We know a lot about what we ate. We know a lot about how the mounds are built. Uh, their mounds are packed earth and clay, and they have flat tops, and um, there's some structures built on top of them. We know a lot about the archaeology from that point of view. We don't know a great deal about how the society was structured. There's this tendency when we find cultures, uh, when we're researching cultures in the past to assume that they were hierarchical and that they were kind of very religious and that they had, uh, had god kings or some kind of thing, some kind of power structure like that at the top of them. And it seems like some of the, some of the civilizations over in Asia po possibly did have that kind of uh, structure. But there's no, necessar no reason to necessarily assume that Native American societies would have been like that. And we don't know about that from the archaeological record. So, and the, uh, Cahokia was a very much a constructed city. It was, a lot of it was built all in one great big burst of expansion in around about 1050 AD. Uh, so it's very clear that they were very organized and very pragmatic when they were building the city. And so the, the way I've portrayed the Native Americans or the Cahokian Native Americans at any rate in this book is that a number of them are actually fairly pragmatic. They do have the religious and spiritual aspects as well, but they also, they're also very down to earth and they're very, uh, very organized about a lot of the things they do. But like you say, a lot of that organization is actually hidden from Marcellinus. A lot of things go on in the background that he's not really aware of and it's not a hierarchical society like he's used to. And, and compared to the other Indian tribes that are portrayed in the book, it's a much more developed 
and settled agrarian society. Yes, that's right. Uh, then, say, the Iroquois, who, who are basically hunter-gatherer uh, with some farming, but not nearly as much because they do slash and burn yes. uh, farming mm -hmm. in, in the description. Uh, and yet both the, the latter part of the book, which focuses more on the conflict between nations mm -hmm. in on the continent, uh, both are incredibly warlike. Is that, is that a constant basically throughout the Native American cultures in terms of their interactions with other tribes, other nations? There is certainly a lot of archaeological evidence that suggests that many of the tribes did spend some time at war with each other. Uh, they had different, uh, Native Americans had different ideas about property, but uh, many tribes were quite territorial. And the Iroquois were a very territorial uh, nation, in fact. There's, there's lots of evidence for, for violence amongst the Iroquois themselves and between the Iroquois and other nations. Uh, in fact, one of the reasons why, there are, why there's the, the, the Haudenosaunee League, which is the five tribes of the Iroquois, that's actually a historical reality. They had to find some way of avoiding the constant warfare between the various tribes, the various nations, and that was their way of solving that. So, yes, there, there, there was a fair amount of, uh, of, of violence in, in Native America along with the other aspects. Now, Clash of Eagles is the first book in mm -hmm. a series of three? Yes, I have a three-book deal with Del Rey. Okay. And, and it, does, it, it does end on a rather action-packed and sad cliffhanger. Mm -hmm. uh, when can we expect, and I know we're being greedy when we ask this of an author who's just completed a novel and had it put out, but when might we expect the uh, second installation in this story? It's actually rather appropriate because the second book is coming out in the Ides of March in 2016. So it's actually coming out on March the 15th of 2016. I missed it by two days this time. They released the book on March the 17th. Uh, so yes, they are, they're coming out at one year intervals. So March 2016 for book two and March 2017 for book three. I've actually finished book two and I've delivered it already. So I'm actually now working on book three. So I know what happens in book two. But so it, it'll be a while before it comes out. We won't out, ask clearly. what happens, but have they given it a title yet? Yes, they have. It's going to be, a, well, uh, we've had conversations back and forth, and I suggested a, a bunch of titles, and we talked about it. Uh, the second book will be called Eagle in Exile, and the third book will be called Eagle and Empire, in all, necessary, in, in all probability. Eagle in Exile. So we Eagle can expect that on the Ides of March. In the, on the Ides of March, yes, that's right. Alan, thank you so much. We've run out of time. I wish we could talk. Perhaps when the second book comes out, we can have you back, and we can talk about the further adventures of Marcellus. Yeah, I'd very much like to come back. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you again. Well, that's it for this edition of Fast Forward. We hope you found something of interest, and we hope you come see us again. Until then, this is Tom Schott saying, take care. <laughs>